Hello and welcome to World Talks. I'm Diana Skaya. Today marks the convergence of crucial meetings in Brussels. Now, while EU heads of government are engaged in pivotal discussions, NATO defense ministers are gathering at NATO headquarters under the leadership of the new Secretary General, former Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte. Now, this meeting is significant as it's the first of its kind since Rutte took office and focuses on pressing global security issues, among them migration and particularly Ukraine. Joining me now to discuss is Marcin Bujanski, director of the Center for Diplomacy and Negotiation at Collegium Civitas. Sir Marcin, thank you so much for being with us here this evening. Glad to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, sir. So NATO's new chief, Mark Rutte, called uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's plan a positive step, but he was a little reserved about supporting it fully. Now, how do you interpret his statement? Well, actually, everything that's been presented in the victory plan uh, isn't really anything new. All those uh, parts of it, all the five points, have been expected. It's uh, putting uh, Ukraine's uh, main asks in a bit of a different uh, language, and uh, there seem to be more openness to uh, a quicker end of the war from the side of Ukraine, um, some concrete solutions in terms of uh, how any kind of post-war setup could look like, a number of proposals from uh, Ukraine's side on how uh, uh, they could contribute or sort of give back a little bit to Western countries for uh, for their support. So these are all uh, good um, good additions, let's say, to what was presented before. Um, and uh, considering uh, the whole diplomatic offensive that we're seeing from Ukraine and from President Zelensky, well, all of this also raises some goodwill. And I think uh, uh, Mark Rutte, as the uh, as a newly appointed uh, NATO Secretary General, also. Uh, wants to show that there's a, a good track uh, in terms of uh, moving forward to uh, uh, to supporting assisting Ukraine and to to finding a, a resolution in this uh, in this war but the, that said uh, the key issues uh, are still unresolved uh, and in that sense uh, some of the expectations that uh, Ukraine has from uh, NATO allies um, will not be met in, in in the nearest future um, most likely, and probably this is uh, what Mark Rutte was referring to, meaning that well, some uh, some of those uh, points will be hard to uh, achieve uh, quickly. Are you also saying here that you mean that you don't foresee uh, foresee an invite a NATO extending an invitation to Ukraine soon? Anytime well, soon? Precisely. Uh, uh, let's uh, let's touch base on on the two uh, most crucial points uh, uh, at this hour, uh, which are uh, allowing Ukraine to uh, to use weapons, uh, um, uh, long range missiles in the NATO in, in Russia territory, um, and uh, uh, providing an invitation to uh, uh, to NATO. So uh, for, uh, let's let's look at NATO firstly. Um, it is the, it, uh, there's a uh, there isn't a consensus among NATO members to issue that invitation. Let's start from that. Uh, there's uh, been a lot of uh, ambiguity, particularly from uh, countries like uh, Germany uh, uh, and from the White House uh, itself, actually. So uh, this means that uh, Ukraine probably will not receive this invitation in the foreseeable future, although it's been uh, approved by member states uh, that Ukraine's place is in NATO uh, and that they see Ukraine as, uh, as a member uh, in the future. Uh, it's been also raised that uh, issuing an, uh, an invitation at this time uh, can be very difficult uh, from a political perspective, but also from a military one, since there wouldn't be a direct NATO engagement in a conflict, uh, in an ongoing conflict in, in this war with, uh, with troops on the ground. Uh, so that means that uh, NATO would be breaking its own uh, rules in that sense. So it's a difficult uh, process. And uh, while from Ukraine's perspective and, uh, of course, from many allies of Ukraine's, including, of course, Poland, who is a champion here, uh, this is the right thing to do. And I personally agree that strategically, uh, it is one of the key things in terms of deterring Russia to issue that invitation and to show that we are being serious about 
uh, future security and defense of Ukraine. Uh, at this time, there is no uh, consensus to issue that uh, uh, that invitation. Same goes to uh, to providing uh, a green light for Ukraine to use uh, long-range uh, missiles uh, in Russia's territory to hit those supply lines, to hit the uh, airfields where the planes are starting off, uh, which are bombing Ukraine uh, territory. Uh, now, there's been a major diplomatic push uh, to, to receive this green light. Um, uh, com- many countries uh, uh, are pushing for this, including the Baltic states, uh, including uh, uh, Central Eastern European countries. Uh, but the key green light needs to come from London, needs to come from Berlin, and in particular from DC. And while I think there's been a lot of uh, leeway done into this way, uh, we w- shouldn't be expecting that kind of decision to happen before the um, uh, presidential elections in the United States. You mentioned so many important key points here. I'm taking some notes, but let's first, let me ask you about this one first. I mean, you mentioned about diplomacy here. What diplomatic strategies do you think can emerge from this uh, meeting uh, in Brussels to push for peace, but also at the same time putting pressure on Moscow? Well, it, it is really not a new strategy emerging out of Brussels. This is a continuation of a process we could see uh, uh, happening after the summer. It, it started with uh, uh, President Zelensky's visit uh, to DC and uh, to uh, to the General Assembly in the uh, in the United States, uh, where he presented um, the 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 the. the frame for the uh, the peace plan uh, and similarly uh, to US Congress later on uh, in in London and Paris and, and many other capitals so this is a continuation of this process uh, where uh, parts of it, um, particularly in terms of uh, NATO agreeing to uh, provide the full scope of the military package that's been appointed for this year, uh, allocated for this year, which is around 45 billion. We've seen about half of it reach. Uh, at this uh, meeting of the ministers, it was confirmed that they expect the full scope of this package to reach Ukraine this year, which is important, of course. Uh, there's additional funding that's been uh, uh, um, approved by the Americans, around, around half a billion uh, dollars um, that's been confirmed from President Biden. That's been also important. Uh, And Ukraine is also presenting its approach to a potential uh, diplomatic outreach to um, in order to, to, to negotiate some kind of a settlement saying, and rightly so saying, that we need to make uh, advances on the battlefield, on the ground, in order to be able to negotiate any kind of uh, solution. So those, in order to, for those advances to just to happen, we need to receive uh, uh, the adequate amount uh, of military assistance uh, and we need to be able to use it on Russia's territory. Otherwise, we won't be able to reach that state. So a lot of diplomacy has worked around reaching that point. We haven't reached there yet, but this is happening. The other part is is looking internationally uh, how to raise more support for that kind of solution when there's growing fatigue around uh, around the uh, the conflict. And for that to happen, uh, Ukraine uh, needs not only the support from um, uh, from United States and, uh, and and Europe, but also from other countries and in, uh, in the world. And and truly to be able to uh, rally that international campaign. It needs clarity on relation with its most important ally, which is the United States. So for that to happen, it is pushing as much as it can on the current Biden administration um, for Biden to leave a legacy, sort of to to, to do a bold move before uh, he leaves the the White House and here uh, the talk of an invitation to NATO uh, could come in play. But at the same time, it's seen internally in the US and the political spectrum as too risky of a move uh, uh, to do before uh, before the elections uh, as it would uh, definitely influence the current uh, uh, electoral uh, campaign. So despite the diplomatic offensive, uh, everybody's really looking uh, into what will be the result of the November elections in the U.S. Uh, indeed, um, and it's uh, so, uh, it's, it's really, uh, they're definitely coming up. Sir, you mentioned balance. Now, how do NATO countries balance supporting Ukraine, but let's not forget about their own national security and their national security uh, priorities. So how are they achieving this, or what is their goal into being able to maintain this kind of balance? Well, 
it, it of course depends from country to country. Uh, the countries closer to Russia, the Baltics, uh, um, uh, the the, uh, the Nordics, um, Central Eastern Europe uh, have been uh, arming themselves uh, very rapidly. And and then Poland is a great example here with currently the, the biggest uh, uh, spending levels of, of any country in NATO on, on, on defense. We're around 4.7%, which is uh, humongous uh, if, if you look at uh, the historical figures. Uh, there's been also uh, a big change among the EU itself. And, uh, and there's a big push to be uh, arming uh, as a Europe, uh, as a whole, uh, and be prepared to respond, uh, even if there's a change in the White House and there's less uh, U.S. engagement. Um, uh, there's an, uh, a new EU defense commissioner uh, that's, uh, that has been created, a new position uh, uh, in the new European Union Commission, uh, which will be uh, responsible for coordinating those uh, uh, common defense strategies and the common work of defense industry and there's also a major push to um, to inject much more uh, much more capital uh, there's also been uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion in terms of building a, a whole european wide uh, defense aerial defense so so sort of like an Israeli type Iron Dome to give, an, uh, give a, a comparison. You know, so to be able to defend from uh, from a potential attack from Russia or or other uh, or other malign actors. So there are a lot of uh, uh, initiatives ongoing. There are new policies being appointed. Uh, money is being put uh, put in place. So of course all of this also is very costly um, uh, and it raises challenges because uh, it's hard to put money into uh, those uh, uh, home defense capabilities at the same time putting enough resources into arming Ukraine. Uh, but it's uh, also um, right to argue that uh, our arming Ukraine and supporting it as much as possible on the battlefield is one of the best but the possible investments uh, in our own defenses uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, to deterring Russia um, in, the, in the future. So uh, all of this means that more resources have to be allocated, but it also means that they have to be allocated uh, much more uh, efficiently and also more boldly and, and, and smartly, strategically, uh, hence uh, the, uh, allowing, giving the green light uh, for Ukraine to um, uh, attack uh, targets uh, inside Russia, uh, uh, which is, of course, the the, the key uh, key political element here. And I think if it would be given, uh, it would it would also uh, allow uh, a bit more focus uh, uh, on on our own defenses as Ukraine could uh, could push forward um, uh, uh, and potentially uh, from that uh, level of uh, military engagement uh, gain some advantages when it comes to uh, a, a, a negotiating a, a settlement uh, in a diplomatic process. Mm -hmm. And so just very briefly, because we're almost out of time here, but I mean, you mentioned Israel. Do you think that the recent developments in the Middle East could shift now NATO's focus away from, uh, from Ukraine? Well, they have been uh, since uh, since many uh, many months already. Uh, so, uh, if if anything, uh, um, maybe today's events with uh, the killing of uh, the head yeah, of yes, uh, Hamas by Israel mm -hmm. forces uh, uh, could be something that uh, uh, could lead Israel to take a step back, saying that uh, they've accomplished uh, um, one of their key goals in in, in this war. But again, this nothing will change before the the elections in the U.S. because this is also something that Netanyahu is, uh, is is waiting for. When it comes to NATO's engagement, uh, NATO is not uh, holistically that much uh, involved in the region. Uh, it's particularly, of course, its most important member, the United States, that has uh, influenced there. Uh, other European countries, frankly speaking, uh, don't have much uh, much uh, much influence or impact right now at events in the in the Middle East, which is uh, one of Europe's also problems. Something that it needs to uh, address better. But bottom line here is that uh, if there there is a broader conflict, an escalation, for instance, an all-out war uh, with Iran between uh, Israel and Iran, engaging, of course, also Lebanon, and and then and, and a regional escalation of this conflict uh, uh, that would engage uh, U.S. forces, that would uh, engage uh, NATO, and uh, it would, of course, mean that uh, you know Ukraine uh, would uh, wouldn't receive the amount of focus that it should be uh, should be receiving. Thank you so uh, this much. This already has. A Thank you so much. Mr. Martin Brzezinski, for your uh, input on this uh, on this topic, uh, Director of the Center of Diplomacy and Negotiation at Collegium Civitas. Thank you so much for unpacking it for us all here on TVP World Talks. Thank you very much. 
And that's all for this edition of World Talks here on TVP World, where every world matters. I'm Diana Skaya. Thanks for watching.